So this is the western side of Bagan Bun Head and I think you can tell or see why it was uh, no non-starter for, for the, the Vikings to get around the side. Um, unfortunately we're a little bit away or if you can see right down there in the very on the horizon straight ahead is Hook Head where is the oldest extant lighthouse in the world which is um, Certainly there was, there was some sort of monastery there of, of uh, St. Renduin, I think it was, who, um, who even from the earliest days uh, were keeping a, 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 a fire burning overnight to, to help shipping. Uh, then William Marshall, I think, rebuilt the lighthouse um, during his tenure over here, and it's still standing today right out in Hook Head. So that's at the bottom of the, um, the, the peninsula here. Um, on the far side of Hook Head is uh, the Hook River, which is the entrance to um, the Three Sisters, that's the River Shore, Barrow and Knorr, and leads to Kilkenny, and more importantly for this story, Waterford, because after they part, and I'll just swing around, again you can see the cliffs, this is the uh, western extreme of Bag and Bun Head, and you can see why nobody was willing to try and get around uh, to, uh, to try and attack the Normans in the back, because they just blooming well couldn't. But this is Bag and Bun Head, and after they uh, were here for a few months, uh, Raymond's uh, forces would uh, basically take all the cattle that they had collected over the months and months and months, and make their way um, up the coast to, and we'll just go the sea route. Uh, follow Strongbow, who went that away, and up the sea route, and Wexford is about 10 miles I think and as the crow flies in that way and uh, that would be their next target um, but we'll go and see if we can see the Norman walls first and foremost so here we are at Bag and Bun walls you can see the sea in the distance there let me try and zoom in a little um, but this is between what looks like a double entrenchment uh, there's the outer wall facing north there's the more southerly wall, and behind, if we look through these gates, oh, that way, is Bag and Bun Head, that's leading directly south uh, towards the Atlantic. It sticks out like a kind of, I think I describe it as like an arrowhead into the into the sea, uh, with the sharp end just over that way. So this would be part of the walls that the Normans would have defended in the summer of 1170. I'm just going to swing around. Uh, there is out north where the Vikings would have come down from uh, obviously the, uh, Waterford when they met up with their Gaelic allies, the Orions and the, uh, the Desha and it's just leading back towards the uh, other side of the peninsula where we've just come from but I think that gives you an idea I mean this is both sides of land obviously they would have had timber stockade on top but completely um, amazing that it's still standing here today but it's way above, I mean, this, this bank on, on my left hand side is at least twice as tall as I am and uh, stretches the entire length of the, uh, of, the, of the headland, cutting it off from the, the rest of Ireland. It must have been incredible to, for the, when the Vikings arrived to see this huge bank uh, with, a, as I say, wooden stockade atop it. And, um, I think uh, there were 70, 70 archers in Raymond's army when he arrived in 1170 and uh, so their range was about, well, certainly back to that, um, uh, to, to the first uh, electricity pole you see there. That's a, a hell of a distance to try, and, to try and get through to not even find yourself able to strike back. But um, as I say, let's pull out a bit. At least twice as tall as I am on my left. It's a little bit further uh, worn away on the, on the right hand side, but it probably would have been the same. Two stockades, um, basically where that telegraph pole is, and then directly across from it where the tree is. Um, would have been that high? I don't think so. Probably not as high as the telegraph pole, but certainly a significant thing. It would have been where we're standing now. Darkness would have been the whole length of it, sun being to the south. It, it would have been completely dark, frigid in here. Um, I presume they would have some sort of um, fighting platform on the inside of both, uh, certainly along the left hand side and then on the far side of this one, so that they could be up there and 
casting down. Of course, Raymond in 1170, the first thing he did when he heard there was an army coming down from the north was sally out and um, he and the horsemen went north from here, uh, back towards Feathered, back beyond Feathered. I think there's a place called Battlestown, it's a, it's a town land called Battlestown and they think that that's where it, the, he uh, intercepted the Vikings and their Gaelic allies. Uh, obviously, uh, the numerical advantage that they had meant that he could not stop them, so he fought a fighting retreat the whole way back from over that, uh, the horizon, coming back south towards Bagnanbun to arrive roughly, I would imagine, where this uh, sort of path or this old uh, track used to lead to. Um, where they had the the opening to the uh, to the gateway of to the to the, uh, the fort, which in those days was called Dundonald, by the way, and um, presumably around this spot, we're told that uh, a, a chap suffering from leprosy, uh, William Ferrand, uh, made his name uh, fighting just because he wished to die in battle and without all that glory, he made a, a stand here alongside Raymond, and they held up the army. Uh, long enough that they could um, secure the fortress, but the uh, the Vikings had, or the the Gales, I would imagine, given their uh, lack of armor, had got so close to the gates and, and fo almost forced entry that it was only through a sheer f piece of good fortune uh, that uh, the cattle that they had been stealing since they arrived in Ireland uh, bolted and stampeded down along the length of these, this um, this alley of. Uh, of earthen banks, and then exploded like a cannonball out of this uh, the gates over here, and impacted the uh, the, the tightly packed ranks, and that broke them up. And I, I would say that would have stopped any army, and much like it did in the film Zulu. Presumably that's where this is taken from, uh, or it was taken from. And then the Normans were amongst them. They were shooting arrows and. And um, you know, in amongst them with their you know the Norman cavalry, and were absolutely devastating. And if we can go a little bit further, just where those houses are, the army retreated in that direction, only to find the estuary had flooded since they had crossed it in the morning, and 500 men died trying to cross it in the evening. And it was a complete and utter rout by 120 men of an army of between two. 3,000 men, um, and it would set up the uh, Norman advance to Waterford uh, in the months, uh, in, sorry, from the 23rd of August, 1170. So here we are at Bagnambun Head, an absolutely incredible place to visit, and we can see the Norman fortifications built in the summer of 1170, still standing pretty well. But I'm going to sign off uh, to go back to Carrigan Bano which is becoming the centre of all things Norman in the southeast of Ireland and really is worth a visit. So uh, we'll see you for another video in a little while.